Yo, cut away the Okay. Am I already? I'm on camera now. Great. Um, opening joke. Sorry, I had to step outside because I forgot to download it from the cloud onto my computer. And, uh, so I was standing outside using the Wi Fi from the mall next door to download. And I had a joke in my head. And I forgot it. Oh, yes, I remember now. I'm sorry, it's a joke I told last semester, and I hope that you've all forgotten it. Uh, but it has to do with the theme of tonight's lecture, which is, as we'll see, uh, about the assimilation that occurred in early 19th century Germany, a very, very important element, uh, disturbing element, but a very important element in the history of Jews in Europe. Uh, as you can see, the, the crowd is kind of withering because a lot of people have gone up north for the season, but um, we still have a massive internet audience, so to all of you who have gone up north, and for all of you all around the world, in the Philippines and Turkey and everywhere else where some <laughs> Greek people watch this. I'm not joking. There are not actually really. six people in Turkey who watch my lectures. Wow. Say, say hi to my relatives in Istanbul. <laughs> Hello to relatives in Istanbul. Okay, so anyways, here's a joke. There's a guy who wants to join a restricted country club. Do you remember this joke? I think you told it. No. I did tell it last semester. I'll tell it again. Okay. Just laugh really loud because few people in here, it changes the dynamic. So he wants to get in, but when he goes to apply to get into the club, the, uh, the owner says, or the, the general manager says, listen, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Goldstein, uh, I hope you realize that we are a restricted country club. We have a very, we have a very special clientele, and I just don't think you'd fit in here. And he says, well, you know, what does it take to get in? I certainly have the wherewithal, the membership dues, things like that. Uh, I can show you my portfolio. And it's, it's very impressive, but, you know, we cater to a certain type of a person, and I don't think you'd really be comfortable here. So he says, well, what does it take to enter? He says, well, first of all, you have to have a sponsor. Someone who is currently a member has to sponsor you. So he says, well, can I see who are members here? I says, sure, and he brings out the membership list. He looks down the list, Abercrombie and Barclay and Cohen. Oh, perfect. So he says, I'm going to go over to Rep. Cohen's house and I'm going to say, listen, can you sponsor me to um, enter this country club? So he leaves the, uh, the office and he goes, drives over to Cohen's house, knocks on the door, big mansion. Cohen opens the door and he says, Shalom Aleichem, Reb Yid, my name is Goldstein and uh, I'd like to join Flaming Cross's country club. <laughs> and I was hoping that you would sponsor me. And Cohen says to him, Listen very carefully, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Goldstein. I am a Presbyterian, and my father was a Presbyterian, and even my grandfather, Oliver Shalom, was also a Presbyterian. It, the laughter is really much louder. It's just, it's just like, kind of oh. Okay, here we go. Let's, uh, tonight's lecture is about Rachel Varnhagen, a very significant character as a... Uh, as uh, an emblem, really, of some profound and sometimes we'll see disturbing social trends in 19th century Europe. Uh, you'll get a sense from the lecture that, in fact, this is not a Saturday morning sermon. In many ways, this is going to be uh, a difficult and problematic theme. Maybe that's why we have a, a thinner audience today. But it nevertheless addresses issues that first seriously arose at the beginning of the 19th century and uh, continue to plague the Jewish world today. We'd like to thank Mr. Eliezer Hermes for sponsoring today's lecture. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the support. Being here is sponsorship enough. We love it. But for those of you who are off up in New York and in New Jersey enjoying the, uh, the fair weather there, we certainly encourage you to sponsor. I think we have three or maybe four of the most lectures left that are not sponsored. Um, and otherwise, we're, we're great. Okay. Her dates are 1771 to 1833. She lived the entirety of her life in Berlin, with the exception of some traveling in the uh, region of northern Germany. Her most important claim to fame, and this is on a global level, and she's much better known perhaps in, the, in German history than she is in Jewish history, is that she maintained one of the 19th century's most significant salons. I'll spend some time in the lecture talking about what a salon actually is and what it meant to German culture, but that is primarily her most uh, significant contribution to world culture. Uh, but at the same time, although she was of Jewish origin, she ultimately converted to Christianity, like many of her peers, and in fact she could not wait to shed 
the burden of Judaism and join generic culture in a Christian mold. So we'll have to explore exactly why that was and why that trend continues to today and what perhaps are the antidotes and the challenges to meeting that uh, difficulty. What I'd like to say at the outset is that, <clears throat> you know, if we were to be parachuted into early 19th century Germany and we were to go into a large city like Berlin and you would see young Jewish people who were, you know, thinking about conversion to Christianity, the correct question would not be why would they do it. The correct question would be why not? Why should they not do it? The pressures to convert to Christianity were overwhelming. It was not a coercive pressure. It was a, it was a uh, kind of a, it, it was a, uh, a vacuum that was sucking Jews into the outside world because there was very little in the Jewish world to hold them fast to their traditional ancient values and beliefs. The uh, rabbinic establishment had by and large failed the youth of that period to invest in them a sense of the value of Jewish culture and tradition. They found it desiccated and without meaning. And when they looked to the outside world, they saw only opportunity and possibility. And it was merely a small meaningless ritual of baptism that kept them from joining the uh, larger stream or the larger current, shall we say, of world culture and participating in all of the exciting things that were happening out there. We sitting here in a synagogue in the tw late 21st century are the survivors of that phenomenon. Uh, and for us, because of our perspective, it looks so alien. And in fact, we say, like, why would you want to do that? It's such a betrayal of thousands of years of Jewish history, so many generations of Jews. But in reality, if we were to put ourselves properly in that historical context, the choice would have been clear and was clear for many Jews at the time. We represent what many sociologists call the hardening of the core. As the periphery becomes much more diffuse, as the, as the outsides of the population become less you know, entrenched in core values, they tend to fritter away, and the people who remain towards the center uh, in a kind of centrifugal force, no, it's a centripetal force, are drawn in closer. So we're kind of in close to the core. We feel the gravity of the Torah. It's a nice metaphor, isn't it, really, Mr. Rodriguez? We feel the gravity of the Torah, and we circle in... Uh, Okay, I can't work it any further. But the idea is we stay close to the center here, and it's hard for us to understand what's happening on the periphery. But nevertheless, that is really the phenomenon we're going to be looking at. All those Jews at the periphery, and as we shall see, they were the largest proportion by far. To put it in historical context, this is an era when all the countries of Western Europe were exploring the possibility of emancipating the Jews. Emancipation essentially referred to the transference of transient status of the Jews, which they currently enjoyed or endured, to citizenship status. Uh, like for example, I happen to be a Canadian citizen, I hold a green card, so I have certain rights and privileges to live in this country, and I can travel relatively freely in and out of the country, things like that, but you know, nevertheless I am still a landed immigrant, and I could lose those rights, at, you know, lose those privileges under all kinds of circumstances. I can stay here for a very long time, I have like a year on my card and I have to renew it and things like that, but that's basically the status of Jews in Europe for 800 years, they were transients, subject to the whim of the ruler. Yes? How do you get the youth back into the temple? That's, the that's an yeah, excellent question. Uh, I'm going to have some slides on it in about 40 minutes. Okay. And they're good slides, and they're things we can do right now. Um, so, uh, and that's the way the Jews were. So a lot of the states in Europe were exploring ways of perhaps emancipating the Jews, not emancipating the Jews. There were arguments for and against, as we shall see. We'll look very quickly at each of the countries that were really important. Uh, France is caught up in the zeitgeist of the revolutionary era. And although when they first, um, you know, <coughs> proclaimed liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, and brotherhood, uh, they didn't think of including the Jews. In fact, they didn't think of including women, and when they were specifically asked by Marie Gouge to include women in that statement, they said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. We're only dealing with men's emancipation. The women's question would take quite a bit longer to solve. Um, so the Jews put up their hand and said, what about us? And the, uh, the French revolutionary said, "Are you? wait a second, 
no, we weren't thinking of you either. But ultimately, within a few months, in the year 1790, uh, France emancipated the Jews of Bordeaux and Bayonne, the Sephardic Jews, who were really much more acculturated to French society. They were Francophones. They were they dressed like French people. They did not live in such tight little discreet knots like they did on the German border in Alsace-Lorraine. And so they received emancipation in 1790. And one year later, in 1791, they extended as well even to the much more indigestible mass of Ashkenazi Jews living on the border with Germany with their distinct Yiddish language, not French, with their high concentration in certain areas of the economy, uh, with their distinctive dress and so on. They too were considered French citizens. Uh, and ultimately, uh, they confirmed that. 20 years later, there was a challenge to it. Many people in France felt that the Jews were taking advantage of their emancipated status to economically dominate the rest of the population. They were, their residence rights were unlimited at this point. They had no discriminatory legislation keeping them within certain economic activities. And um, as a result, they petitioned Napoleon, who was at that time, uh, I believe he had already proclaimed himself emperor, or perhaps would therefore shortly, um, they said, wait a minute, it was a mistake to emancipate the Jews. So Napoleon, in a very bold move, um, asked that the Jews assemble a, an authoritative body that could answer on behalf of world Jewry. Right? Sometimes it happens, it makes people feel better. Sometimes when, you know, as Rabbi Beryl Wein likes to say, never confuse Jews with Judaism because Judaism is great. Jews, sometimes. So uh, every now and then when, when a Jew does something wrong, like behaves badly in line or something like that, I feel, I feel compelled to go up to the person who's offended and say, listen, on behalf of world Jewry, I want to apologize. You know, it makes them feel better so to apologize. Anyways, we'll edit that part out if I have time. Uh, here, so what Napoleon does, he brings together the great Sanhedrin, and he asks them some very basic questions. The Great Sanhedrin, I should tell you, it was an amazing achievement to bring together this body that had not met since the ancient world. Uh, and it was met with some suspicion, but a great deal of enthusiasm in the Western Europe as well. It was headed by the, the great uh, commentator on the Mishnah, David Sinsheim. Uh, but uh, the majority of the people who were in the Sanhedrin were actually non-observant. They were maskilim, who really wanted emancipation to be confirmed by Napoleon. So he asked them several pointed questions that were, were designed to try and measure their degree of attachment to the uh, French homeland. He said, for example, do the Jews regard themselves as Frenchmen or something else? And of course he said, well, we regard ourselves as Frenchmen, men again. And then he said, uh, so if we were to get into a war with, let's say, Germany, the Jews of France would fight for France, right? And they all, as the minutes record, stood at once and they shouted, jusqu'à la mort, we'll fight for France just to the death. Well, it doesn't matter. We will certainly defend France. And then he asked them a couple more questions that are sort of like, uh, well, a little more ambiguous answers. He asked them, for example, um, do, are Jews allowed to marry non-Jews? And the Sanhedrin says, someone answer? They said yes. They said yes. They sort of said, well, technically, uh, could you repeat the question? They said yes. Uh, they said it with a great deal of kind of like padding, saying that we don't recommend it, yeah, <laughs> cross your hands, find your back. It's not uh, acknowledged and not encouraged, but if a French man marries a, a, a Jewish man marries a French woman, then we do not have the power to dissolve that relationship. Why would they say yes to such an obvious no answer? Very easy. We have to survive. Uh, exactly. They knew what Napoleon wanted to hear. They knew that Napoleon wanted to hear. We, we sell ourselves very good in other people. Exactly. We knew what Napoleon, what answer Napoleon wanted, and the Sanhedrin said, yes, it, no, it can't, yeah, okay, and we gave it away to Napoleon, and Napoleon said, fine, so you guys, I'm not going to listen to the critics, and your emancipation is confirmed. He did put in place some 
anti-Semitic legislation at that point, which is larger than our discussion for now, but nevertheless that confirmed emancipation and in many ways the fateful answers of the Assembly of Notables, later known as the Sanhedrin, charted the way in which Jews would carve out their existence, to mix the metaphor, charted the way the Jews would sail their existence through modern states. Here's a great picture. Um, Napoleon here in kind of Caesarean garb and in kind of a background of, of ancient Israel with the menorah and the Judean hills in the background. And he is, uh, like Caesar, lifting this fallen woman who represents Judaism from the ground. You see that she's holding the ten tablets here and she's looking longingly up to uh, Napoleon as her savior. He did have really messianic uh, complexions for himself, where these critics here of the church and other movements are all telling Napoleon, no, you simply can't do that, we can't rescue Judaism, allow Judaism to fade away into the distant past. Napoleon, on the other hand, views himself as very heroic and as, uh, you know, promoting Jews. He actually had a, a coin uh, minted for this occasion, which is, I, I could not find a, a copy of it on the internet to show you, but it has Napoleon literally as Moses giving the Ten Commandments to a Jew, you know, it's a, certainly Can you pose that question to other religions, like to the Catholics, whether just... No, well the Catholics are an entirely different situation because France is predominantly Catholic and he has his own problems with the Catholic Church. He wants to control it, uh, but the Jews were the most significant non-Christian minority, by far the most significant. Yes, Mr. Lyons. This happened before or after he observed the Jews mourning on Tisha B'Av? This would be... Uh, after his trip through Egypt, if I remember correctly. I believe it's after, but I'm not positive. Good question. But he definitely had a lot of respect for the Jews in many ways. Okay, uh, Austria, a little different. This happens to be a, a, I couldn't think of a good picture to put here. This is a, from an Austrian anti-Semitic cartoon from 1918. Uh, totally out of context, but it shows like kind of the world Jewish conspiracy here. Austria goes another route. Austria will not confer citizenship on its Jewish citizens. They don't really have citizenship for anybody. They only have subject status. However, the Austrians confirm the permanency of Jewish residents by promoting something called the Edict of Toleration. And that was in, uh, 10 years before, I'm sorry, it was uh, yeah, about 10 years before the Jews were emancipated fully in France. The Jews in Austria were given the right to dwell permanently and basically equal treatment under the law which was a huge thing for Austrian Jews. They did not enjoy that in Russia. But that's essentially what we want. I mean, here again, I'm a Canadian, I have a green card, but if someone like takes a baseball bat and smashes up my car, if I go to the court system, I will have, at least in theory, the same protections as if I were a citizen, because I'm legally in this country and therefore I should have the same protections of law. That's essentially what the, uh, the state gave the Jews in Austria. So for them, it was a little bit easier. Uh, Russia had a terrible time with it. Russia did not grant the Jews equal status until 1917, and that was only because the Romanov Empire fell and a new government took its place. They abolished the Pale of Settlement and so on, but Russia basically tried to hold the line with a very medieval attitude right up until the 20th century with all kinds of absurdities like a state prosecution of the blood libel in the Bayless trial of 1911. So this was really the last holdout of Europe. But what we have to concentrate on is Germany. Germany is one of the most problematic states vis-a-vis -vis emancipation. They neither uh, held their ground like uh, Russia and tried to keep the Jews in the medieval world, nor did they uh, rush ahead into emancipation like France, nor did they find an easy compromise like Austria did. Germany wrestled with the idea of emancipation for a hundred years, going back and forth, heavily affected by the French invasions during the Napoleonic era, also during the Revolution of 1848, and they could not come to terms as a larger society. Again, it's not even a unified country at this point. They could not come to terms with what to do with their significant Jewish population who were concentrated in the cities. In some of the larger cities, Jews were as much as 30% of the population. That's a very significant element and they didn't know what to do with them. We spoke in the class on uh, 
on Rabbi Hirsch about the Jewish response attempting to slavishly imitate German values and German norms in order to demonstrate to the Germans that Jews were deserving of emancipation, but that's not the story that we're going to explore today. By the way, this image, again, I was running short on ideas for images. This is a, a 1920 uh, anti-Semitic book cover. Uh, the title reads, The Sin Against the Blood, a novel of the times by Dr. Arthur Dinter. And it shows uh, the Aryan man here, you know, muscular and so on, no shirt, and the, uh, the Jewish vulture who's weighing him down and will eventually feed on his carcass. So it's a, it's a novel that speaks about, or a, a, not really a novel, even though he calls it a roman, it's a book that speaks to the, uh, the German fears of eventual Jewish domination, which is something that we'll explore in a later class when we talk about Hannah Shenish. So let's get past this for a second. How did Jews relate to it? The Haskalah, which we touched on briefly in the lecture on Rav Hirsch, uh, there ha there's a significant difference between how the Haskalah was implemented in Western Europe as opposed to Eastern Europe. Haskalah, you recall, is the modernizing movement within Judaism of trying to take Judaism and make it more adaptable to the modern world. How that was expressed, in Western Europe, it was openly assimilationist. Many Maskilim themselves took the the final step of converting to Christianity and urging their followers to do so. Whereas in Eastern Europe, meaning basically Poland and Russia, to a certain degree parts of Hungary, uh, they did not become assimilationist. They generally, some exceptions maybe with Poland, uh, they, they tried to change Jewish culture in either a Zionist or a socialist direction. Very different kind of approach. In Western Europe, they advocated uh, linguistic training in the vernacular, German in our context. In Eastern Europe, they did not really press the use of Russian or of Polish. Again, Polish is a little bit different. They did not press Russian for sure. They advocated Jews becoming proficient in modern Hebrew or the standardization of a literary Yiddish, who we'll talk about in two weeks or after Pesach when we have the Shalom Aleichem. Uh, in Western Europe, there are many uh, leading non-Jewish uh, intellectuals like Christian Willem van Dom, one of the most important of this period, who advocated for the Jews and argued that Jews should be granted equal status. In Eastern Europe, none of that was happening. There were not similar figures who were supporting the Jews. But we're concentrating on Western Europe for today. Yes? Did the Western European Jews assimilate, but at the same token, kind of keep their Yiddishkeit Jewishness undercover? It, there's a spectrum. There's really a spectrum here. There are some who abandoned Judaism entirely and wanted to totally bury any kind of memory of a Jewish background. Um, others wanted to keep a Yiddish atam to things, and others really tried to uh, keep Judaism in its integral form, as we discussed in the lecture on Rabbi Hirsch, but adapt the externalities. You don't have a significant ultra-Orthodox population in Germany where they're trying to, like, deny modernity, but those are basically the ranges. The opposition uh, to emancipation comes from the outside, fears that the Jews, if they were emancipated, would constitute an état dans l'état, a state within a state, because they are such a well-organized people that they could network so effectively and economically they could form monopolies and, and eventually uh, fix prices and things like that. Uh, this early idea, the early form of racism called Fulkism, which is basically a, uh, a, a proto-racism where the Germans believed that there was a certain natural quality to the quote-unquote German soul, and Jews could not participate in that, um, and they wanted to exclude them from those sort of things. Uh, and general fears of Jewish domination, particularly in the cultural sphere, where Jews were very active in literature, the arts, and so on. This is an interesting uh, joke. Um, postcard, anti-Semitic, from the early 18th century, and, and it shows a, um, a generational difference between um, German uh, Jewish father and mother whose children are of an age where they're just beginning to learn courtly dancing. And this is something that father and mother never did, but they've dressed their children up in the latest <coughs> non-Jewish fashion. You can see his tzitzes are still hanging out over here. Uh, but they, they look quite awkward trying to dance. That's the joke of this picture. They don't look graceful. They look rather simian in appearance and in form. All angles jutting out, uh, the heavy nose, the ragged hair, and things like that. 
and the message of this kind of postcard, of which there are hundreds of examples, are the Jews may look like they're trying to fit in, but there's no way they'll fit in. They're always going to be maratwa, they're always going to be, um, you know, inept at things that are truly German because they don't have it in their blood. They can't, they can't do it. Okay, last contextual slide. We come to the aspect of gender emancipation. I've already discussed how, in general, women were disenfranchised from uh, these movements of the period. Uh, even in France, which had the most radical emancipation movement for non-Jews. Um, but Jewish women were, were quite anxious to find ways to build status in this environment. And one of the ways that was uh, created, and Rachel Barnhagen was extremely important in this, was the establishment of this thing called the Salon. The word Salon is French for living room, and it simply is a sort of a monthly open house that these women, typically upper middle class uh, Jewish women, sometimes converted, sometimes on the verge of converting, would have, and they would open their homes to two basic classes of people. They would open their homes to uh, wealthy individuals in whose society they would like to mix. So it was a, it was a kind of a social climbing uh, sort of thing. You'd throw a party and you'd invite people who had a little more status than you in the hopes that you, know, you would be included in their circle. And they would also invite up-and-coming young intellectuals, often who had no connection to the intellectual establishment of the era, meaning they often did not hold university positions, they did not uh, have any established exhibitions of their artwork, things like this. And they were kind of like the entertainment. So you would invite you know, cutting edge new poets and artists and literati and journalists, and you bring them to your home, and you also invite these wealthy people whose circle you'd like to bring together. And there was entertainment for the wealthy and hopefully patronage for the intellectuals at the same time. And they created this environment which was completely separate and really a novum, completely separate from the established venues of, uh, of status seeking that were existent today. This was not a university lecture open to the public. This was in someone's private home and there was status associated with. And you know, if you could get the right people, any home would do. So these salons, which were really um, designed by Jewish women who were seeking status and were blocked in other more conventional ways of gaining status, really became the, uh, the cultural sensation of the first half of the 19th century. And it gave many young intellectuals a tremendous start in their careers. Speaking of Varnhagen in particular, uh, I mean, if you're familiar with 19th century German history, it's like she has a whole cavalcade of stars passing through her doors. I think the two most famous, one earlier in her career and one much later in her career, are the great uh, poet and writer Goethe, who was uh, a member of her salon, and much later, the uh, Jewish poet Heinrich Heine, uh, who was also one of the, uh, the people who crossed her threshold. So that's where she made her major impact in world history. But it's only for women. No, no, women and men. Absolutely, it's mixed. Yeah, it was not so from. Nicht so from. Okay. So let's talk about Varnhagen in particular. Um, her fa she came from a wealthy background. Her father was a jewel merchant. Uh, he afforded his children not too much in the way of a Jewish education. Part of the failure of the Jewish establishment at that time was that people tended to rest on the simple inertia of thousands of years of Jewish culture. They just figured that since I do it, and my father did it, and my grandfather did it, you'll do it too. It'll just keep going because it's always been going, with very little investment of new energy in creative <clears throat> education for their children. The sons got a very rudimentary education in what was necessary to maintain ritual status, how to get an aliyah at shul, that kind of thing, and the daughters got nothing. Um, and the, what made this a little bit worse was that uh, this patriarchal attitude affected Rahel Varnhagen very seriously when her father died. Because according to traditional Jewish practice, um, the sons inherit, daughters do not inherit when there are sons. I gotta speak carefully because I have my daughter Elisa in the audience right now. But your brothers inherit, not you. Wait a second though, it gets worse. And then, uh, if, God forbid, your mother and I were to pass on, and your 13-year-old brother Alexander becomes, you know, that primogenitor, he's the first boy, 
then you would have to ask him for money for your daily upkeep. How do you like that? Is that hand raising opposition there? Yeah, go ahead. Let's say I'm the one that's earning the money. Well, who says you can earn the money? Well, let's say just we're living in a totally Jewish, uh, Jewish lacha based lifestyle. As we are. Well, not in like America. I'm saying like in like okay. we don't have to think about laws and stuff. And I earn the money in the family. Does he? Do I still have to ask him to spend my money? Uh, no, you don't. But if you're married, there's a separate rule too. I'll tell you about that rule later. <laughs> after, 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 before or after the wedding? <laughs> yeah, that's right. My uh, Dana. Okay, so here, anyways, what you can do, and what your mother and I have done, by the way, is you can uh, create these things called matana mechayim, you know, a gift while alive, such that our will is set up so that you don't have to rely on Alexander to, to give you money, okay? So, yeah, and thank God willing, it's 120 years, you know, it's 120, but, that's, but this is not the way they set it up. It, it's really a system that works very well in the ancient world and in the early modern period, well, maybe in the medieval period, where you have, you know, women always living within the shadow of men, either a father or a husband, uh, and under rare circumstances, a brother. But uh, as you're m merging into the modern economy and things like that, there are a lot of stressors involved. So what ended up happening is her brothers took over the business, and they just could not wait to marry off Rahel and her older sister. Because the idea was once they get married, then the brothers are no longer responsible for their upkeep, and so they're really trying to push them out of the house. It worked very well with her, I'm sorry, her younger sister got married first, but they could not marry Rahel off right away. Uh, in fact, it took quite, she was not married until she was in her 40s. Wow. Um, part of the reason one might think was because um, she had a very poor self-image in a couple of different ways. One of them was that she had uh, an extremely negative view of her own, um, of her own uh, physical appearance. Let me return to that when I just tell you the slide that we just skipped over. Um, one of the reasons we know so much about her and about her circle and her activity was because she wrote literally thousands of letters, which her devoted husband later published posthumously. Um, and so through her, we have a tremendous uh, source text, a database of what it was like to be a Jewish woman of this class at that time in Germany. She is kind of like the Glückel of Hameln, but on the other side of the assimilationist divide, a uh, hundred odd years later. This is a, uh, a German post, uh, postage stamp that ironically alludes to this aspect of her activity as a letter writer. So as a youth, she was very conflicted about her personal appearance. She, had, she went on and on for pages about how she found, found her face was so unremarkable. I mean, she looks pretty good in these pictures. We have lots of pictures of her. But uh, she was especially disappointed with her chin. I spent a lot of time talking about her chin. And perhaps out of this kind of frustration with her difficulty getting a shidduch, that um, she was openly quite rebellious as well. Uh, she flaunted the uh, local mores by openly violating the Sabbath. And violating the Sabbath was the kind of thing that you know, people would regularly do at home in private, but she would go riding in a carriage on the Sabbath, which was you know, a public violation, which is somehow stepping over the boundary of what even acculturated or assimilating Jews would do at the time. Uh, a friend of the family remarked on her, her position when she was a young person that her suffering is greater than its cause. Meaning, what has she got to complain about? I mean, she comes from a wealthy background, she has a healthy family, so her chin is a little bit weak. That's something to be upset about. But this is the kind of youth that she led. With regards to her Judaism, she had a very ambivalent and perhaps one would say even negative attitude. Look at this quote, which I'll read out loud. She writes in one of her letters to um, a, a Jewish young man named David Veit, who she had uh, about three or four years of correspondence with, never ended up in a romantic relationship. But she wrote, I have a strange fancy. It is as if some supramundane being, meaning God, just as I was thrust into this world, plunged these words with a dagger into my heart. Quote, yes, have sensibility. See the world as few see it. Be great and noble. But I add one thing more, be a Jewess, unquote. And now my life is a slow bleeding to death. Every evil, every misfortune, every vexation is from that. <laughs> 
She describes her Judaism as a slow bleeding to death, meaning her, her attachment to the Jewish people is it's just in her way, left and right, constantly. She can't move in the right circles, she can't attend university, she's constantly blocked with things that she can never really express herself. She's an intellectual, but she does not find satisfaction in the Jewish tradition, nor in her Jewish circle of friends, leading to a tremendous degree of frustration uh, that, that we see today. Her social aspirations were grand, like many women of the time. Henrietta Hertz is shown here. And she's like at that class in society where her family has attained a certain degree of wealth, but they cannot translate that wealth into social status. So she's always on the fringes, on the outside of society, wanting to get in. And this is a constant refrain on her part that she feels that it is her Jewish background which is keeping her from really mixing with the true society. I know she's a very admirable character up until this point, but again, I think I told you, it's not a Saturday morning drusha. But um, like many people, um, many people of her generation basically converted, and that was a ticket, as Heinrich Heine put it, to general culture. Simply converting to Christianity, and then it was all over. Then you could mix with everyone. And the degree of, uh, of antipathy placed on Jews at the time was really quite negligible once they had converted. Many, like Henrietta Hertz, simply waited till their parents died, and within days of her, their death, she simply would convert, and then she was off and again. Um, Rachel Varnhagen would ultimately convert on the day of her marriage, um, as we shall see shortly. She was engaged twice to rather interesting people, but the uh, engagements schlepped on for several years and ended up being uh, invalidated in the end, including Don Rafael de Urquijo, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, who was the Spanish consul delegate to Berlin. Uh, she was engaged to him, how do you pronounce that? Urquijo. Urquijo. That sounds so good. Urquijo. Uh, and he, he, they broke it off after two years of engagement. She was not ultimately married until quite a bit later. Estimelle, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, when they convert to be accepted in society, are they really or are they still Jews? The, the society they moved in became so suffused with Jews that the level of acceptance was generally total. Uh, definitely when you move a little bit lower in the socioeconomic rung, then there's a lot of seething mistrust that will eventually bubble to the surface when we get to the 1870s. Um, and we'll talk perhaps in another class about Heinrich von Treitschke and his uh, movement. Uh, Napoleon invades in 1806, and this spells the beginning of the end for von Hagen in many ways. Her salon is broken up because uh, Berlin has been taken over by the French by the French, and many of her close associates flee the town, and they're not able to gather in the same way that they had before. The family business falls apart. Uh, the, the brothers stop sending as much money to her and her mother, and they ultimately cannot afford the home that they're living in, so the mother and Rahel have a huge falling out, and she moves to a small apartment, uh, which is more in line with the uh, very modest means that her brothers are supplying her with. In 1808, she meets uh, Varnhagen. Uh, I don't want to go into his biography in great detail, and it takes quite a while, but by 1814, she ultimately settles and decides to marry him at age 43. They do not have children. Uh, her salon basically is all over, and that takes us basically to the end of her life. This is a picture, by the way, of Varnhagen's salon, a period picture. So if we look at her legacy, and I have lots more slides. Usually I use the legacy as the last slide, but I promised you some kind of upbeat modus, so we're gonna, we're gonna move to America briefly. She is, even though I've given you really the highlights of her biography, it's not a heroic biography in Jewish terms. However, to the outside world, she is viewed as a cultural icon. Uh, many times by Jewish women who identify with her and with her frustrations. The most prominent of which is, of course, her biography, the great philosopher Hannah Arendt, who also has a problematic biography on her own. She had some very uh, close relationships with professors when she was in Germany, and those professors ended up becoming Nazis, even though she was a Jewess who eventually moved to the United States. Um, and she wrote perhaps the most important biography of, our, of uh, Von Hagen, and has been translated into English as well. So she, for some women, she represents kind of like the the, the heroism of someone who is constantly held down by a society that will not recognize 
their potential because of their religious background and their gender, and somehow she rises above it to create something much greater than herself through her promotion of general culture. Her literary efforts, although not resulting in a book or something like that, the letters nevertheless are extremely powerful. She was a very effective writer, and they make for really quite exciting reading, even in the 21st century. But from a Jewish perspective, you know, Vusforan Medeles does. What kind of a young woman is this, and why are we looking at her so much? So I would like to contend we're looking at her specifically because the kind of problems that Rachel Varnhagen experienced 200 years ago are precisely the ones that we are still dealing with today. And to that end, I would like to share with you some statistics from the National Jewish Population Survey, and I will conclude with uh, the, the famous Heilman thesis. So before I take you to these statistics, did I see a question? Yes. Yeah. Would you say that the kind of assimilation that was going on in Germany at that time would be comparable to what we have today in the United States? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, there are different features. Um, the, uh, in many ways, the assimilation in America is far worse. At least Von Hagen knew what a Passover Seder was supposed to look like. At least she knew something about what it meant to observe Shabbos. You know, as, as my Rebbe used to teach, you know, we're coming up to Pesach, the story of the four sons. So my Rebbe, Zechot Sadek Livracha, always used to say, it's not four brothers, it's four sons. The Zeda is the Chacham. He's the one who actually practiced Judaism as it was in the old country. Then there's the father, who is the Russia, who, you know, abandons Judaism and so on, and he says, what is all this for? I don't need this. The uh, Tom is the grandson who sees that his father and his grandfather have some kind of conflict, and he just goes along with things, but at least he has some consciousness of what Zaidi does on Pesach. But the fourth son, the great-grandson, is Sheno Yodea Lisho, the one who does not know how to ask. He doesn't even have a concept of what Pesach is like. So we're living, as he used to say, like um, orphans at a shiva house mm -hmm. where, you know, we have all these people coming in to visit us and it seems exciting and we're very, you know, like if you ever see little children at a shiva house, they think it's fun because, yeah. you know, look, all these relatives, all these people, and, and they don't realize the reason why these people are coming is something very tragic and sad. So that's really our generation. And then there's the fifth son who doesn't even show up. The fifth son doesn't show up, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, so let me take you to the National Jewish Population Survey. This is a major survey that is conducted every 10 years by Federation. Uh, it is somewhat controversial. I'm showing you the 2000 results. There are 2010 results which are slowly being released and are problematic. Uh, and 1990 results were, were just shocked the Jewish world. The Federation movement really changed dramatically when those results came out. So there's, there's a little bit of debate over the specific numbers. Uh, demographers will quibble about them, but let's just look at the general patterns. First of all, intermarriage in America, uh, as the caption here says, have increased since 1970, but the rate of increase has slowed since the 1980s. So I think that caption is trying to put a positive spin on a really negative graph, because ultimately, uh, in the last decade of the 20th century, 47% of Jews who had got married, married a non-Jew. That's almost half, and according to some estimates, it was actually over half. But just think of it, if you have 100 Jews getting married, 47 of them are marrying a non-Jewish partner. It's a, it's a terrifying thing. And that's only slightly up from the 1980s. It's been like that for about 30 years. There's no reason to think it'll be any less in the last decade as well. Yes, The good news is that I think the divorce rate is like 50%. Well, okay, and then they get back on the market. I wonder what the second marriage is. Actually, I think I have seen statistics. Uh, it's m intermarriage is far more likely in second marriages. Mm. So, you know, the divorce rate may be up for, for intra-Jewish marriages, but the chances of those people then remarrying another Jew are e even less. Uh, so that, that's a really scary statistic, and perhaps this is like the, the clarion call for all of us. It's like it, intermarriage is perhaps the lit motif, the litmus test of of what constitutes Jewish identity. Um, but the good thing is that, and this is something we should all know obviously, but the statistics really bear it out, that education at childhood level is the <coughs> best antidote to intermar intermarriage. Like, for example, asking uh, intermarried uh, Jews, 
did you have any Jewish education? 43% said no. So uh, looking at the causality problem the other way, the, the high degree of uh, low Jewish, that's terrible, the low Jewish education is possibly correlated with intermarriage. You don't send your kids to day school, God forbid, you have a much higher chance of them intermarrying. And it drops 29% for Jews who went to multiple days a week uh, Jewish school. Like I did myself, I went to a public school during the daytime, and then for three years I went for a couple of hours to the local Jewish school for, you know, to learn a little bit about Hebrew and things like that. It's a, a funny story, my, you know, it's a, it's a great story really about how my parents went through so much sacrifice to give me that education. I'm scared to put it on the internet, so many people should see it, but, um, but I will tell you this, my father would appreciate this. When my father was inquiring from his cousins and his brothers and sisters, what, what school should I send Henry to? And the, uh, the parents said, well, send him to this school. They, they said, send him to this school, that school. But whatever you do, don't send him to that Orthodox school, because they're crazy over there. So my father, <laughs> kind of guy he is, he said, that's exactly where he's sending me. And I ended up going to an Orthodox school. But it was just like evenings and that kind of thing. Uh, this is 23% for Jews who attend once a week. So in other words, if children who go to, let's say, Sunday school, it's, it's still a uh, significant uh, decrease in the risk of intermarriage, but it's, it's really you know, only half of no Jewish education. And in Jewish day school and yeshiva experience, 7% of kids who went to a Jewish day school will intermarry. That's you know, an alarming statistic, but it's certainly far less alarming than no Jewish education whatsoever. So the best you know, way to deal with this problem, ab initio, is to make sure that your kids get uh, a good Jewish education in yeshiva when they're young. Uh, and this is, the good news also is that the trend is moving in that direction. It's, this is another example of hardening of the core, of you know, the periphery may be assimilating away, but the Jews who retain a closer connection to Judaism definitely are getting more Jewish than they used to be. And I have a slide about that as well. So, uh, in, in polling adults and children uh, uh, who are, uh, what kind of education do they get? So, adults say 27% say they got no Jewish education. Children, only 21%. Uh, who got one day a week? Adults said 32%. Jewish children said 25%. And then when you go over here to Jewish day school, the situation is actually reversed. 12% of adults can say they had a Jewish education uh, at day school level but 29% of kids, one out of three kids, um, have a, a Jewish day school education. That's pretty impressive. Dade County actually has especially high um, marks in this regard. They're doing pretty well. Okay. Uh, last slide, I think. Yeah, well, let's skip this one here. Let's go straight to the last slide, but I'll take questions before I do the Heilman thesis. Any arguments or discussions so far? You know, I mean, yes. as you show the percentages, but like you said, because of the periphery, the absolute numbers of stars. Absolutely. So that's, that's just really scary. That's the big story. The big story is all the people who are missing, who are not in this. We're measuring smaller and smaller numbers of people. Again, the hardening of the core. It may look nice if you're looking at the core, but if you look at the whole picture, it's really terrifying. Okay, I'm going to share with you now uh, the Heilman thesis. This is uh, the, basically the work of Samuel Heilman. He's a very important, probably the most important Jewish sociologist alive today. He's written many important books. Uh, this is taken from his seminal work, uh, Portrait of the Jews in the Latter Half of the 20th Century. And he didn't put it in a graphic form like this. Maybe, Dr. Heilman, if you ever see this, you'll put it in one of your books, something like this, maybe with a professional artist. But basically, he contrasts two groups of people. He contrasts the Jewish community in America at the midpoint of the last century, uh, about 1960, let's say, or 1950, with the Jews at the end of the 20th century, let's say 2012 or 2000. And if you were to roughly graph Jews in terms of their level of Jewish identification, you get two very different curves. Let me explain the chart here to you. I have to undo my button because my suit stretches in an unflattering way. <coughs> and uh, this is the internet, so everybody can see it. So. <laughs> yeah, so this uh, chart here shows uh, roughly what it looked like if you were to take a picture of American Jews around 1950 or 1960. 
you would have a significant number of Jews who were highly assimilated, but very little attachment to their Judaism whatsoever, no Jewish practices at all, perhaps an, a, a consciousness that they came of a Jewish background, but really no connection to it that's meaningful in any way. You would have a very large proportion of Jews who had some Jewish identity. And you can measure this identification either in terms of religious practice or in, let's say, Zionism or in some form of cultural Judaism. Like, for example, if you're really a, a big proponent of, of uh, Yiddishism or if you're a big Jewish theater goer or something like that. So there's a large number of Jews who have some Jewish identity. And you also have a large number that have, let's say, moderate Jewish identity, which would include things like, let's say, keeping uh, kosher home, but not being so careful about keeping kosher out of the house. Right? You keep a kosher home, it's a lot of effort. Out of the house, maybe not so much. You go to shul on, sh on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the rest of the year not. But you, you are very careful, you fast on Yom Kippur, let's say. Or maybe you light Shabbos candles and then you watch the news. So there's like, as a, a, or again, not only in religious terms, high Jewish identification might be something like, uh, or moderate Jewish identity might be something like, you visited Israel once. You give every year to the Federation, and you went to Israel once. You don't go to Israel every four or five years, but you did go to Israel once, that was a big trip, so that would be over here. And the bulk of American Jews would be in this section. Then you have down here at the bottom, a small number of American Jews who are highly identified. These are the, the Jews who are living completely within the yeshiva world, or completely within the Zionist world, or within the Jewish socialist world, but their whole life is about being Jewish. The vast majority of their friends are Jewish, uh, they do Jewish things, read Jewish books, practice Jewish rituals, things like that. Essentially, Orthodox Jews pretty much are all in this highly identified section. So to sum up 1950, you have kind of a camel hump where most American Jews are in the moderately affiliated range up here. Now, if you look at American Jews, says Dr. Heilman, 50 or 60 years later, it's the opposite. You have a much higher proportion of highly assimilated Jews. This is what we were talking about a minute ago. This is the, the periphery. Jews who have very little or no connection to their Jewish background, observe no rituals, uh, never visited Israel, never given to a Jewish tra charity. Even the UJA doesn't know they exist. And that's really saying something because if you get on the UJA mailing list, the only way to get off is through the FBI Witness Protection Program. <laughs> so very high proportion of Jews in this category. But instead of going up into the, into the moderate identity, this population of Jews with some or with moderate Jewish identity virtually disappears. I mean, among my generation, I don't know anyone who keeps kosher at home and treif out of the house. Uh, maybe they have, you know, milchik, fleshik, and chinik, Chinese, but okay, forget. But no, everybody, they either keep kosher all over or they don't keep kosher at all. What's the point of halfway? Those Jews are gone. Those Jews are basically bottomed out, the moderately affiliated. And here on the far end, the highly identified, there's clearly an uptick in the highly identified Jewish population. The Orthodox population, for sure, has grown significantly, and there's you know, more day schools, more daf yomis, all kinds of things like that. So Heilman cautions us to say, don't feel so happy about this uptick in the highly Jewish identified because he says it's a temporary bubble. He says that we cannot sustain this population. The reason is because of the Abramson rule in history. Mr. Lax, the Abramson rule? Money, it's all about money. Because listen to this, and he demonstrates this with startling clarity. In 1950, when these Jews here in the moderately affiliated range, when they gave their charitable donations, they always gave their money to the right. They always gave their money to Jews who were more affiliated than they and their institutions. They always gave money to, they didn't send their kid to a Beis Yaakov, but you know, if a Meshulach came, they wrote a check for the Beis Yaakov. They didn't go to Israel maybe more than once, but they would always give a donation to Israel. They gave their money charitably towards Jewish institutions, which made it possible for these Jews on the high end of the identification spectrum with the incredibly onerous burden of, of day school tuition, uh, these Jews 
made it possible financially, which was a, a tremendous difference and, and made it possible for this population to actually grow. However, when you get to our time, uh, these Jews are now gone. There are very few of them. They are much, much wealthier. Amer Jewish per capita wealth has soared, but when they give their money charitably, they give it out to more assimilated causes or even totally non-Jewish causes like the art gallery. You know, they may be very valuable uh, institutions like, you know, the March of Dimes and things like that, but they're not Jewish institutions by any means. And so all of the money that used to fund this lifestyle over here has been disappearing dramatically, which makes it, according to Heilman, untenable for Jews to remain in this population. He actually ends his book on a very dark note by saying that if a solution is not reached to this scissors crisis where the expenses go up and the resources go down, then he says American Jewry is headed for a disaster that could s completely gut its uh, population. And he argues that the solution is to immigrate to Israel, because only in Israel with state-sponsored tuition and things like that can the high levels of Jewish identification be maintained. Now whether or not the majority of American Jews are going to take Heilman up on that offer, no one yet has really refuted his uh, economics, and it's one of the more you know, uh, scary aspects of, uh, of American Jewish culture. I will, I will formally end now, and I'll take questions, but I want to mention the, the upside of all this. We're talking about Rachel von Hagen, and in many ways, her drive to assimilate to Western society is endemic of a global, global of a regional crisis where Jews fail to educate their youth appropriately. We see statistically it's incredibly important that we provide for Jewish education at all levels, but particularly for those sensitive childhood and adolescent years. And I urge you to think of that carefully when you decide your own charitable donations for the coming year. Thank you very much for your attention and your indulgence. And uh, we'll turn off the camera, but I'll take questions.